Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine brought to you by AACC and the Clinical Chemistry Trainee Council. View this and many more pearls as well as other free educational material at traineecouncil.org. Hello, my name is Ethan Jacob. I am an assistant professor of laboratory medicine and pathology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on fetal maternal bleed testing. Hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn, or HDFN, is a clinically significant disorder which historically has been a leading cause of death in the fetus and newborns. In it, fetal red blood cells are destroyed by maternal antibodies which target paternal antigens expressed on the fetal cells. For me, it's one of the success stories of modern medicine in that the original theory as to its cause, developed in large part by pathologists from Chicago, Dr. Ruth Darrow in the 40s, to successful treatment and prevention occurred over the space of approximately 30 years. In general, the main immunizing event is thought to occur during labor as fetal cells enter the maternal circulation. Unlike neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia, the immunization occurs during one pregnancy and the destruction of the cells, in this case, red blood cells, typically occurs in a subsequent pregnancy. Other events such as trauma, interventional procedures, and spontaneous or induced abortions can also lead to immunization earlier in the pregnancy, although most occur at labor and delivery. In the figure to the right, red blood cells in the fetal circulation are separated from the maternal circulation, although oxygen and other substances can cross. One such substance is immunoglobulin G using the neonatal FC gamma receptor. After this occurs, binding to fetal red blood cells may occur if a cognate antigen is present and destruction results. Historically, the major antigen in question was D, Rh antigen. With destruction of red blood cells, there are multiple consequences. The fetus becomes anemic. Compensatory mechanisms lead to increased cardiac output, potentially failure, and extramedullary hematopoiesis. Eventually, high drops. Interestingly, during in utero hemolytic disease of the fetus, the breakdown products are metabolized by the mother's liver. After birth, however, the child's liver is not able to convert the bilirubin, which results in jaundice and kernicterus, a neurologic complication. Treatment developed in the last 50 years has dramatically decreased infant mortality. This includes bilirubin, which helps to convert insoluble, unconjugated bilirubin into a more soluble form, which can then be excreted. More invasive methods, such as exchange transfusion, are possible, including in utero transfusion. These, among other efforts, have significantly brought down morbidity and mortality, but have not eliminated them. In the 1960s, various groups in North America and Europe realized that anti-D formation might be prevented by infusing anti-D antibody. Somewhat surprisingly, this has been shown to work very well. The key to its use is recognition of potential immunizing events. At this point, the standard of care dictates a single dose of RIG be given at 28 weeks of gestation in RH negative mothers to prevent immunization events during pregnancy, and then a second dose after labor and delivery in RH negative mothers with RH positive infants. Uh, the key to the second dose is that it be given within three days of delivery and it be of the proper amount to cover the fetal maternal bleed. One vial of RIG will be sufficient to prevent immunization with 30 ml of fetal blood, 15 ml of fetal RBCs from historical studies. Luckily, less than 0.5% of deliveries lead to such bleeds. To determine when additional rig is needed, first a qualitative test is used. The rosette test is a serologic test, which is designed to be positive when more than one dose of rig will be needed. Then a quantitative test is used. 
Historically, a klaihauer becky is performed, which makes use of the fact that fetal hemoglobin is more resistant to acid pH than adult hemoglobin. Due to this, adult cells have a ghost-like appearance compared to the more darkly staining fetal cells. This is a highly manual test which requires hand counting and has been shown in proficiency testing to underreport bleeds in some instances. Flow cytometric measurements allow for various advantages, not the least of which is a larger number of cells being counted. This adds to the accuracy and precision of the testing, especially at low level bleed. Flow cytometric testing is based on being able to distinguish fetal from adult cells using antigenic targets such as fetal hemoglobin. The cells have been permeabilized, allowing for the labeled antibody targeting fetal hemoglobin to enter the cells. In this example, a small population of fetal cells are identified in the third decade. The majority of the cells are adult cells with primarily adult hemoglobin. One drawback of this method is that a typical adult has a small amount of fetal hemoglobin containing cells, labeled here as adult F cells. In our hands, these typically stain less intensely than the true fetal cells. Daily controls are necessary to determine the proper placement of gates. For instance, low titer antibodies particularly in homebrew systems, can make distinguishing fetal cells from typical adult and adult F cells difficult. Although designed and FDA approved for the detection of fetal cells in the mother's circulation, such assays can also be theoretically used to measure increases in fetal hemoglobin containing cells, for example, in therapeutic interventions to treat sickle cell anemia. This may be complicated, however, depending on how the fetal hemoglobin is distributed in the red blood cell population. Although typical bleeds only require one to two vials of rig, occasionally large bleeds, such as this one in the top figure, are detected. More problematic is the second example, in which a large population of presumed adult F cells are present. The percentage of fetal hemoglobin in the mother's circulation can be increased during pregnancy, complicating enumeration of fetal maternal bleeding. Proper gating is essential here to allow for distinguishing between the true fetal cells, which stain fluoresce more intensely. Most troublesome are large amounts of such cells seen in presumed hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin cases. In these cases, the shoulder of HPFH cells starts to encroach on the true fetal cell gate. This prevents an accurate determination of the fetal cells as in all likelihood, some of the cells in the gate are not truly fetal in origin. Due to the consequences of missing a fetal bleed that can result in an immunizing event, it is safer to count these cells and cover with the appropriate amount of rig. In a mother with known HPFH, this can make it difficult or impossible to determine a fetal maternal bleed accurately. Dual antibody platforms can be helpful in such situations. Again, the single antibody setup is shown with a moderate number of adult F cells and no significant fetal bleed. In the bottom left blue histogram, Anti-fetal hemoglobin is used on the x-axis and anti-D on the y. Thus, relevant true fetal bleeds would be in the right upper quadrant. Similarly, in the lower right, a second antibody, such as this one for carbonic anhydrase, can be used to distinguish fetal cells, which should be negative, from adult cells. Combined with fetal uh, hemoglobin antibody, the true fetal cells are in the left upper quadrant. Theoretically, adult cells with higher amounts of fetal hemoglobin can then be distinguished from true fetal cells. Some potential pitfalls can occur. For example, if the mother of the child is a partial D expressor, distinguishing the cells with an anti-D antibody may be problematic. In addition, 
if a significant amount of anti-D has been given to the mother prior to the lab draw, it may mask the D epitope from the diagnostic antibody. Use of antibodies distinguishing fetal from adult cells by antigen maturation could also potentially be an issue if this does not occur as expected in the mother-infant pair. The dosing of RIG is based on knowing the amount of fetal cells in the maternal circulation using one of the quantitative tests. Then using the conversion for vials of RIG is performed. Rounding is up if 0.5 or above, uh, then a safety margin is added of one additional vial. Therefore, even if the calculation of RIG is suggested at zero, one vial of RIG is always given if the mother is Rh negative and the child is Rh positive. Typically, the blood bank does not know the weight of the mother. If it is known, it can be substituted into the equation. If not, the standard is to use 70 kilograms. In this example of a relatively large bleed, the maternal circulation is approximately 4,900 milliliters of whole blood. With a 1% content of fetal cells, a bleed of 49 ml results. This converts to 1.6 vials of rig, which rounds up to two. Adding the safety margin of one additional vial gives three vials of rig. Some test prep books advocate a shortcut in these calculations. However, I think it is useful to know what the standard calculation is. This allows for personalization of the dose if the mother is not 70 kilograms. In addition, it's important to note I use whole blood in my calculation, which leads to the 30 mils per vial conversion. Some use the 15 ml of fetal RBCs per vial. One just needs to remember to calculate the volume of fetal bleed appropriately. One of the major causes of immunization is not recognizing when RIG should be given. Which scenario does not require RIG in an RH negative mother? The essential issue is to recognize the mother is RH negative. If the fetus is RH positive, or the RH is not known, then RIG should be given. In scenario one, the RH of the fetus is likely not known. RIG is therefore required. In scenario two, the RH is also likely not known, so RIG is recommended. In the third trimester, a qualitative or quantitative test for the amount of fetal bleed should also be performed. In scenario three, the fetus is known to be RH negative, so RIG is not required. It is possible that the fetal bleed detected could cause an immunizing event, but RIG would not prevent it since the fetal cells do not have the target antigen. Essentially, the cells do not have D on their surface. In scenario four, the fetus is RH positive with a negative rosette test on the mother. That tells us that additional doses of RIG are not required. However, the baseline dose of one vial would still be given since the test is designed to tell us if additional RIG is needed only. Finally, scenario five. Even if the mother is planning to have no future children at risk for HDFN, she may very well need a transfusion sometime in her life. Preventing the potential formation of anti-D, complicating future transfusions, justifies the use of RIG here. Thank you for joining me on this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on fetal maternal bleed testing. For more like this, as well as articles, podcasts, and more, please visit the Trainee Council at traineecouncil.org.